and this is the city of El Paso, Texas. It is known as the Pass to the North, but is more commonly called the Borderland. The city is rather isolated from the rest of West Texas, but is still filled with vibrant culture and with mining, tourism, and business industries benefiting its large economy. However, throughout the 20th century, the mining industry was dominated by the American Smelting and Refining Company, more commonly known in El Paso as a Zarco. For over a hundred years, the smelter drove the economy of the borderland, paving the way for El Paso's bright future. However, it would come at a hefty cost. For decades, the people were tricked into believing that the smelter brought prosperity, but with a series of scandals being pulled under the rug, it was apparent that they were fed lies from the infamous concrete smokestacks. The two concrete stacks stood for over half a century, becoming a regional icon. But within half a minute, the two were brought down. A lack of information prevented most people from knowing the true history of the smelter up until now. So come along as we learn the true history of the Borderlands infamous copper smelter. April 13th, 2013, the day El Paso underwent a major change. The day where the Azarco smokestacks were brought down in an explosive demolition. The story of the Azarco smelter is filled with prosperity and tragedy alike. However, in order to grasp this history, we need to go back to smelter's origins all the way to the 19th century. During the early 19th century, Kansas had been used as a great mining spot for many miners as it was full of natural resources. One of these miners was Robert S. Town. He was a famous miner in the state of Kansas as he had found many natural resources such as oil and copper. But during this time, he gradually noticed that the state was running out of its supply of these resources so he would need to look elsewhere. Thankfully, he knew just where to go, Mexico. Due to Mexico's geography, it had been seen as Easily exploitable by many miners around the world for its abundance of iron, gold, and of course, copper. Town was one of these people, but he never got those resources because of one reason. Mexican politicians had barred him from entering the country due to the strained relations that Mexico had with the United States following the Mexican-American War. So Town would have to yet again look somewhere else. But he knew where to go now, due to a rich spot in the southwest, El Paso. In its current form, El Paso had only been around for about two decades until that point. And by then, El Paso wasn't even a big city. It was smaller compared to the rest of the cities in West Texas. For a town, he thought it was perfect, since the city was rather rural, and he had secured a contract from unknown assailants in the Arizona New Mexico Territory. So there, he would begin smelting lead at what would now be known as El Paso Smelter, established in 1877. With the smelter now open, job opportunities opened up across the whole city and people would jump to get them. They paid high for all the hard work that went through the lead smelting process. Off the banks of the Rio Grande River, workers would often reside in Smelter Town. It was a district where there were homes, a hospital, and a school. During its heyday, it was very popular for smelter workers due to the proximity to the smelter. And in 1888, Town, along with many other miners, would form the American Smelting and Refining Company the entity more commonly known as a Zarco. With the smelter now part of a global mining company, the facility would have to compensate for the massive income of materials, especially lead. Between the years 1900 and 1909, the smelter would build additional furnaces and smokestacks to compensate for the additional materials and the extra emissions emitted from the smelting process. Many of these smokestacks were over 100 feet tall, but would not be the biggest development in the early 20th century. By the year 1910, the copper industry had been booming due to its abundance in the southwest, and the smelter took advantage of this by building the first converter house. The converter house would melt copper down into its liquid form, and in a separate building, they would be casted into anodes to be shipped off to Azarco's refinery. 
Another building constructed was the main powerhouse. The original powerhouse for the smelter had burned down years before the new one was built. This new one was sophisticated and very complicated for its time, requiring many hours of labor to operate. Following this development, the production of the smelter had nearly tripled by 1920, involving lead and copper at the same time. By this point, Azarco had retained the monopoly of being America's biggest smelter company. Along with having a smelter in El Paso, they also possessed the smelter in Murray, Utah, and the one in Tacoma, Washington. By the mid-1930s, the arsenic plant had been constructed. The arsenic plant was created after excessive arsenic was found in the lead smelter. Once the arsenic was captured from the lead smelter, it was backed and then ventilated to be filtered out and sold off. Due to the increased emissions though, two new smokestacks would need to be constructed. The first was a 300 foot smokestack. Eventually it would serve the zinc plant. However, for the arsenic plant, a brand new 450 foot stack was constructed and it emitted a lot of fumes. Over the next decade, carbon monoxide levels would go up exponentially due to the emissions from this new arsenic stack. There was some concern over the emissions, but profitability eventually became the main concern after a long period of debating. With the emission concern being pushed to the side, more concern was put on the zinc plant. It had suffered delay after delay, and people were concerned that it wouldn't go up. Thankfully, it was constructed, and the emissions were connected to the 300-foot smokestack, fulfilling its final purpose. During this time, much of the ore process was from Mexico. In Mexico, they didn't have many facilities for processing and smelting ores. It was also mainly cheaper to import it to Zarco rather than smelting on their own. With the high employment, good working conditions, and profitability, many workers at the time declared this the prime of the Zarco smelter. Salaries were very high for employees, and even with the tough working conditions, they were worth it, especially for people who did not possess any form of secondary education. And also, the smelter was very profitable for El Paso's economy. However, the time would come where the view was changed drastically by the birth of two monsters. Beginning in the year 1950, residents of the city would see a brand new smokestack being constructed right next to the original 150 foot lead stack. But this stack was taller than the rest, standing at over 600 feet tall and looming over the entire smelter. Many longtime employees had become worried since the original 150 foot stack was working just fine at the time, bringing up the concern that the Zargo smelter was going to ramp up more production and emit more hazardous materials. The suspicion within the workforce grew even larger when shops and buildings right next to the smelter for the smelter town were demolished without an explanation from the company leading the suspicion to an even bigger smokestack being constructed, ramping up. And the suspicion would eventually prove to be a reality. During the summer of 1966, as the days passed by, the world would gradually see as a concrete stack had begun construction. As the days went on, this concrete structure would grow in height tremendously, surpassing the 450 foot arsenic stack and at one point reaching the height of a 600 foot stack before continuing to grow even taller. One former Zarco employee, Arnold Pinedo, said it best. The continuous line of trucks carrying concrete was tremendous. They'd rotate every day 24-7 to bring the concrete necessary to build the giant 800 foot smokestack. When construction was completed in the year 1967, it stood as the world's tallest smokestack at the time. This title was short-lived, however, and after a few repaints, and with the infamous name of Zarco paint on the smokestack, another change at the smelter would begin. With the brand new 800 foot smokestack in place, along with the value and quantity of arsenic going down across the nation, the 450 foot stack along with the arsenic plant itself was torn down to make way for more developments in the converter house and to create a brand new plant. It is unknown how the arsenic stack was demolished, but more than likely it was imploded from its base, as seen by this photo taken in the early 70s. With the toxicity of the arsenic stack gone, the smelter's priority shifted towards developing new plants to find profitability, cleaning up the smelter, while also running more efficiently. The biggest development to Zarco's facilities during this time was the acid plant. During the smelting process with copper, it was found that high amounts of sulfur would be emitted from the converters. When the sulfur dioxide was captured, it was filtered out or scrubbed and then sent to the acid plant. Following this, the sulfur dioxide was mixed and converted into sulfuric acid and then sold off to other companies across the whole world. 
Midway through construction of the asset plant, Smeltertown had been decommissioned. The company had taken and evicted all of its citizens from Smeltertown, as the CDC had found that half the residents in the town had been exposed to lead absorption in their blood. Smeltertown itself had been in decline ever since the early 1960s, but it wasn't until the CDC found that the land was contaminated with lead pollution when it eventually meet its end. One of the leading figures within this lead study was a young Dr. Philip Landragon. Landragon today is a world-renowned doctor in children's health, and his study at the Azarco plant would be a key basis at looking at other facilities around the country, particularly Azarco's other smelters. In terms of making the plant more efficient, in the mid-1970s, construction had begun on the bedding plant. For much of its history, the smelter had its ore processing facility outdoors, leaving the area around it vulnerable to gases such as carbon monoxide. So in the late 1970s, construction had begun on an enclosed processing facility. With space becoming lackluster around the smelter, time would come for a major demolition. Sometime in 1977, the original 150 foot lead stack would meet its end in an explosive demolition. Like the former arsenic stack, the 150 foot lead stack was imploded from space, as seen in this photograph. With the demolition of the historic smokestack, exploitation of new elements would begin, with brand new plants being constructed all over the facility. Where the stack had once been standing, a cinder plant was created. Cinder is a natural element that is found in the smelting process, and with increased copper production into the late 1970s, the cinder plant was a great place to find extra profit. By the turn of the decade, the antimony and oxygen plants had been erected at the site. Like the cinder plant, these plants were used to exploit the leftover materials from the smelting process. It is unknown where the oxygen plant got its materials from. However, what is known is that the antimony was obtained from excessive amounts of it being contained in the bending plant. This plant also possessed the smelter's first metal smokestack, staying at 100 feet tall. Even with all these drastic changes to the facility, the smelter had still maintained lots of profitability due to the copper prices being very, very high at the time. But ultimately, this prosperity wouldn't last, especially with an ongoing scandal. By the 1980s, El Paso had been booming, tourism had rapidly increased, and newer businesses opened up opportunities to the newly prosperous city. Many older businesses had either left or had gone bankrupt, but the polluting smelter still stood, but its relevance and love would begin to slip away. By 1983, much of the antimony and zinc supply of the smelter had run out due to ever-increasing regulations, and one by one, the plants would begin to shut down. The first to go was the zinc plant in 1983 followed by the historic lead plant suspending operations in 1985, along with the antimony and cinder plants closing in 1986. By 1989, only the copper, acid, and oxygen plants remained, but hope temporarily resurfaced with Zarco's Arizona mines increasing ore production and giving the aging smelter more resources. With this newfound hope going into the 90s, a cadmium plant had been built next to the former zinc plant, as cadmium had been prevalent in the ore imported from Arizona. Unfortunately, due to cadmium's toxicity, the plant would close down only a year after operating, as the Zarco's mines would eventually filter out cadmium from their ore. By 1993, the continuous toffee oxygen process technology had been installed, otherwise known as CONTOP. CONTOP had reduced sulfur emissions within the converters, and the remaining sulfur that wouldn't be captured would be scrubbed and sent off to the acid plants. With CONTOP installed, the acid plant was expanded once again, now with the addition of a 300-foot metal smokestack. Once again, the smelter was looking clean and efficient again. Prosperity was at a high again, and it looked like the smelter was destined for a bright future. Until a scandal was uncovered. With environmental skepticism at an all-time high, the EPA had been investigating multiple companies across the U.S. for their environmental infractions, and one of them was a strict contract made by Azarco, Encycle, and the Department of Defense. In the late 1980s, Azarco, along with its subsidiary Encycle, had received a lucrative contract from the Department of Defense. The contract stated that Azarco would import hazardous waste from Rocky Mountain Arsenal in Colorado and send it off to its Encycle subsidiary in Corpus Christi, Texas for long-term storage. Much of the materials imported was hazardous. This included plutonium, napalm, and nerve gas. But instead of storing the materials, Encycle would ship off the materials to El Paso and East Helena, Montana, where they would be smelted. And more than likely, this material was shipped off to other smelters across the country. With the investigation into a scandal being concluded in 1998, 
the EPA ordered Azarco to pay $50 million in fines for illegal recycling. This would lead to Azarco closing down the Encycle subsidiary in Corpus Christi. The plant would soon be decommissioned, and a decade later, all of it would be demolished. With copper prices falling and with the contract gone, the unthinkable would happen. In 1999, the smelter would shut down. Only temporarily though, as it was put under a care and maintenance program, as the smelter would restart operations with copper prices going up. Up until its temporary closing in 1999, not many people knew how the smelting process worked. But now we know for sure, and here is a simplified version of it. This segment will be based on the smelting process post-1993 when Contop was added. Link to the pre-1993 documents are in the description. Work would begin at the unloading facility, where the ore was weighed and measured to see how much quantities of copper it may have possessed. After being weighed, the ore would be sent below the unloading building on conveyor belts and would be sent to the bedding plant, where it was mixed. In the bedding plant, the ore would be mixed with a silica compound, otherwise known as silica sand. In both facilities, excess gas would be ventilated and then sent out to other plants, such as the acid or oxygen plant. After the compound was collected, it was sent to a dryer, where the concentrate was dried, before it was dropped into the contop furnace. The setting furnace would help burn off any slag, which is excess material left over that is not copper, and the remaining copper would be sent on to the converter furnaces. With the ores now at the converter house, it would go through three steps. It would go through three hoods of converter furnaces, before the slag was collected and the ore would continue on to the anode furnaces, where the copper content would consist of 97% pure copper. Following the anode furnaces, the copper was placed on the anode wheel, where it would be casted into anodes. The anodes would then be shipped off to the Zarcos facility in Amarillo, Texas, for further refining. While all this is going on in the smelter, the excess slag collected from the furnaces is dumped outside the facility on a slag flume hill. This process is not uncommon with smelters across the country. However, a Zarco smelter in El Paso was the first to introduce Contop as a working system and in a sense been adapted by many other smelters across the nation and around the world. With the smelter now offline, workers would have to look elsewhere for jobs. Many would move on to Marathon Refinery near the lower valley of El Paso, while others would move to Arizona where Zarco had the Hayden smelter still online. Starting in the year 2000, the facility would undergo a change, removing any unnecessary facilities left over. The cadmium and zinc plants were the first to go, being demolished in the year 2000, followed by the historic lead plant. Along with this, the original 300 foot zinc stack would meet its end signaling the end of Ozarko's original concrete smokestacks. With these new changes completed by the year 2002, the smelter had been in preparation for reopening as copper prices were beginning to rise again. However, the public would not want to see this place reopened. With the company attempting to get its air permit renewed, but by now the last straw had been breaking and the public had reached its breaking point. This began with the Get the Lead Out group protesting in front of the smelter and showing that they didn't want it to reopen. This would later be sent to Texas Governor Rick Perry. With local and regional governments from El Paso and Juarez now opposed to Azarco reopening, the state opted not to give Azarco its permit, and that same year the company would declare bankruptcy, as it was found that 31 of Azarco's sites were excessively contaminated and needed to be cleaned up. Following the smelter permanently closing in 2009, the demolition and cleanup was handed to Project Navigator, an environmental trustee under the leadership of Roberto Puga. The cleanup would call for the demolition of the converter house along with the contop furnaces, followed by the acid plant, the bedding plant, the unloading facility, the former center and antimony plants, the smokestacks ranging from the 150 foot antimony stack to the 800 foot smokestack, leaving only two buildings, the powerhouse and the original 1887 administration building. Cleanup would commence in 2010. It would start off with the contop furnaces and the acid plant. Acid storage tanks around the smelter had been sold off and demolished, while the oxygen plant had been sold to an Australian company before being sent to Namibia. In 2011, demolition on the converter house itself would begin. Demolition was completed in a matter of weeks, however, it was a reflection on the end of an era, the end of a 100 year copper smelting legacy. 
the bedding and unloading facilities would also meet their end in 2011, with both facilities being extremely hazardous during cleanup. With 2012 being just around the corner, many people suspected that the smokestacks would meet their end just like the smelter around them. However, their supporters would come out of the dark. With the metal, antimony, and acid plant stacks coming down a year prior, many people suspected that the concrete stacks were the next victims of the cleanup. To the surprise of many, the demolition was halted because a group known as Save the Stacks wanted to preserve the smokestacks. They thought it was a cultural legacy to the city of El Paso and wanted to keep them as monuments. The trustee, Roberto Puga, gave the group additional time to reevaluate their plan for preserving the smokestacks and how these procedures would carry out with the budget for cleanup. The group made a rather serious effort to preserve the stacks. They even paid an engineering company to inspect the stacks and make sure they would stand for many years to come. Unfortunately, the group was denied funds by city council and the stacks were ordered for demolition in 2013. The demolition uh, were targeting in the first, first or second week of April. Uh, but uh, the, the trust has decided that, uh, that the stacks are going to come down and we're actively uh, planning that. Explosive demolition is one of the most commonly, if not the most commonly used techniques for large chimney demolition. Uh, another basic that both of these stacks are planned for the same event. In its simplest term, I mean, our, all the work's done by gravity. And so the, the, the uh, goal is to uh, basically fall the structure like a tree. In early 2013, preparations were underway. Dynamite had been placed at the cores of each of the smokestacks. The demolition zone had been covered with dirt and plastic to prevent excess dust while also containing all the concrete from the fall. As the morning skyline began to rise, longtime residents would gather up on nearby hills along with photographers alike to witness an historic event on April 13, 2013. Twenty minutes before the blast, water cans would begin misting the drop zone to prevent excess dust. Three minutes before the blast, fireworks are shot in the air to salute the history of the iconic smelter. And at 6.58 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, the blast sequence would begin. First, explosives would tear through the base of the 610-foot stack, and it would take 15 seconds to fall. Around this time, the charges would go off around the base of the 820-foot stack. As the small stack falls over, it would break into two pieces before slamming into the ground. The 828-foot stack would take twice as long, taking 30 seconds to fall. At detonation, the outer stack falls about 40 feet as explosions tear out its bottom. Then the double stack falls slowly to the ground, bringing the Zarco's 126-year presence in El Paso to an end. With the smokestacks now gone, cleanup was almost complete. It was found that the powerhouse contained too much asbestos and as such was demolished, along with extra buildings near the administration building. As of 2023, the administration building is the only building left from the prosperous smelter. The land has remained vacant for the last 10 years, and even though the University of Texas at El Paso tried to acquire this land, it was found to be too costly, especially to maintain the landfill near the old slag facilities. Over the years, there have been many proposals on what to do at the former smelter site. Many have ranged from housing to warehouses to even an amusement park being built on the former site. But as of 2023, the site remains vacant with no further developments planned. Even to this day, people are still divided on their opinions of the former Zarco smelter. While the emissions and all the scandals are rather wretched in the minds of most people, it is rather forgotten that the smelter brought early prosperity to the city and El Paso would not be the same town as it is now without Ozarco. The legacy of the smelter still lives on even to this day, in the form of the workforce who dedicated their lives to the smelter and all its processes. It's been 10 years since the smelter has ceased to exist, but hopefully it can be remembered for generations to come as one of El Paso's historic landmarks. Thank you.